my talk tonight is about education. And before I get to education, I'm going to talk a little bit about our environment. Our bodies right now are being bombarded with radiation. They're pass the waves are passing through our bodies. And we're har harmed. We're not harmed. We're harmless to those waves. We're totally uh, immune to them. They're huge waves, massive. They have extremely long wavelengths and they pass right through our body. And there's all kinds of them going through our bodies. And all we have to do is bring up a little device and set it up and we can pick up these waves that are passing through, to, through us. And all we need is a TV set to find them. And we turn on a TV set, the old-fashioned ones, of course, and we pick up, we call it snow on the TV. And in 1965, two guys were trying to get rid of the waves and to get down to the, the very base so that they could do some testing. And they found that they couldn't get rid of the really long waves. And they said, well, what's going on? And they went out and they looked up into their antennas and, and there was a bird's nest. Oh, this must be the reason. And so they got rid of the bird's nest and they came back in and they could not eliminate the waves. They scratched their head. So then they said, well, fine, let's look at these waves and let's investigate them. And so very quickly, they traced them backwards. And they found what theorists had been predicting for decades that at one point in time in our universe, all matter, all energy, was in a little, small, fine, little, microscopic nucleus. Everything was in this little, tiny nucleus. And then one day, 13.7 million years ago, it exploded. Singularity. Was a, nobody knows how to describe what it was because we can't replicate it anymore on the earth or on anywhere. But all matter, all energy was in a sort of like a plasma. And as it expanded, it cooled. And as it cooled, matter separated out. First of all, it was particles of atoms, and then the atoms became very simple. Hydrogen and helium and lithium. Some people say brilliant, but I think it's ended at lithium. And this started to spread throughout the space that was created. All this gas spread throughout the little bit of space that was forming. And we see it today. We can get telescopes and we can look up and we can see the gases that were formed. And there were some rules causing these gases to behave in a certain way. And one of the rules was gravity. You know, things fall. Things are attracted to each other. And so one particle has a force of attraction to another particle, and they started to clump. The gas particles clumped together. And if you look carefully in the clump of gas, you see little bright, shiny things, called, of course, stars. And we have one, luckily, or we wouldn't be here. Our sun is a star, a clump of gases. And all that's happening is that gas, the gravity is collapsing in, and as it collapses in, it fuses those primitive gas particles into other particles. And that fusion, that squeezing toge together, that fusion releases energy. And that keeps the thing from collapsing down. So you get the energy pushing out and gravity pulling in. And so we have a stable sun. We look up and we see it every day. And it's been shining for 4.5 billion years. Every now and then, one of our, our stars burn out. Our star is going to burn out. We're halfway through its lifestyle. And at the end of its lifespan, it will enlarge. It will become a white dwarf. And eventually, all 
the fusion will stop and it'll become just an ember of iron, which will eventually break up and scatter throughout the universe. It's formed new elements. It started off with the simple ones, and there's more complex ones there now when it breaks up. But every now and then, a huge star is formed, and it glows and glows, and eventually it collapses upon itself. And this huge star, when it, when it burns out, the gravity is so intense that it doesn't just rest like our star. It collapses in on itself, and then there's a super explosion. Of course, we call these supernova. And in that explosion of the supernova, which we see a picture of here, we see them every now and then. Some Canadian discovered one about 20 years ago. It lasts for about three days in the sky. It's very bright, the brightest thing in the sky for about three days. And then it's gone. <clears throat> and that supernova forms all kinds of new elements. And they're scattered throughout the space. So here we are in our little cloud of dust, which has changed from gases to solid, to liquids to solids. We're sitting on a planet, rotating around a sun. And we go out at night, and we look up in the star, and we see a falling star. All we're seeing is a little speck of dust from some distant star falling on the Earth. And so I look at my hands, and I mean, some people may, you know, I look at my hands and I see everything that I see in my hand, even the blood going through the arteries, was formed in some star. I find that amazing. I can't get over it. I just... And of course, Joni Mitchell recognized this as well, <laughs> right? In 1969, Joni Mitchell sings at Woodstock, We Are Stardust. She knew it then. Four years after we figured out singularity, she put it into a song. We Are Stardust. But we're more than stardust. You have a choice. Everybody here in this audience has a choice. Everybody in life has a choice. There's stardust, dirt. D did we come from dirt? Spontaneously? Is that, is that my ancestor there? Right? That's one choice. That's one question. Is that my ancestor? Or... Poof, there I am. I've got a choice. Did I come from the dirt or was I created? But I'm not here to talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> because we're going to assume that there is life. We're not going to argue over how life got here. We're just going to say, yes, there is life on this planet. And this life has changed. And it's gone as we look back through time, as we look back through 3.5 billion years of life, it's changed. It's gone from simple to complex. And here we are, sitting on the top of the pile, humans, covered in hair, nursing our young. Contemplating man, the paragon of animals, and yet to me, what is this quintessence of dust? So here we are, the most intelligent form of life. Pondering tremendous questions of intellect. <laughs> and here we are in Bayfield, on a small little arc 
of time, on the spiral of time, small. We've come across a little idea, myself and my good friend John Smallwood and others, we have, we have a new idea about education. Because as, Mr. as Sir Ken Robertson said in the film we just watched, the schools that we all came from were born from industrialization. And the parents of those schools were, as he said, standardization, conformity. I love conforming. <laughs> and that we educate our kids in batches, he said. We put them on conveyor belts and we have an assembly line and they all come in and Sir Ken said that we do it by age and we group all our kids by age and we move them through in batches, in boxes, in cases. We call them classes. That's a vestige. It's a vestigial organ. We're talking about adaptations. A vestigial organ is something that's left over from an old period of time. We have an appendix. I still have mine. There are kerosene lamps. These are vestig ringer washers. So my wife and I used one when we were younger. <laughs> oh, I'm not becoming old, of course. These are vestiges, and our schools, the way that they were designed 150 years ago, are vestiges now. Because young people have changed. They're not willing to come in and sit down in a classroom. All, not, some people are, some, some were, and I certainly was when I was. But young people today, they want things different. And we, as an educational, as a society, have to adapt to that change in needs by the young people. And if we don't adapt, if we don't change, then we're going to become obsolete. Kodak said, what do people need? What, what do you mean? People are never going to be using film again. No, we're going to keep producing film because that's what people want. Schools are going to be hard to take down. There are a lot of vested groups out there with tremendous interest in maintaining our schools. The way they are, no changes. Oh, we can change a few little things on the periphery. But no major changes, please. What are we doing? What's our school? Well, we have a school here. We don't have any school buses. We don't have any student parking. We don't have any student smoking areas. There are no classrooms. There are no bells. There's no late notes. There's no detentions. There's no corridors. There's no water fountains. There's no school year. There's no textbooks. There's no classes. There's no semesters. What kind of school have we got? <laughs> right? We've changed. We've adapted to students. Students want to change, and so we've adapted to them. And we've only changed one little simple thing. We don't handle them in batches. We just deal with the individual student. Whatever their needs are, and they've got a variety of needs. They all want to do things their way, in their time. And so what we said, fine, let's make the student the center of our school. And that's kind of unique in a way, because, I mean, we all came through the schools where we were handled in batches. And the students like this. It gives them a confidence that they can arrange their lives the way they want it. We have one student, for example, who traveled around Europe for two years playing a guitar, learning how to play his guitar. And he went to school while he did this. We had another teacher 
who for two years traveled Europe and Asia and taught with us while she traveled throughout Europe and Asia. There are no walls anymore for our school. This is the school you and I went to, right? Everybody did the same thing at the same time, and lo and behold, if you did something different. I love this picture. This is our school. Here's our school today. We deal with kids as individuals. They're all doing their own thing. They're in the pool. Some are swimming on the bottom. Some are jumping off the sides. Some are sitting on the sides. They're doing whatever they want to do. They are not synchronized. We are not handling them in batches. We are treating them all as individuals. And that's the only thing that we're doing differently. And we've broken all the rules. I love this shot, too. We're flexible. The student decides when to come to school. They decide when they're going to hand in their assignments, if they're going to hand them in. They're going to decide on their own when they're going to write their tests. We don't tell them when to do it. They make the decisions themselves. All we do is respond to them, try to keep up, try to meet their needs. That's not the school you and I went to. And what is it given to the students? It empowers them. They're now in total control of what they want to learn and how they want to learn it. They decide. If they choose, I don't want to go to school, fine. It's your choice. We treat them as adults. And they love being treated as adults instead of in batches. That's all we do. Here we are. This is our school. We just sit there and our only focus is to communicate with students and to deal with what they want. And today we have, what, 5,000 students coming to us. And we bar them. We put up a barrier and we say, oh, no, you can't come to our school. You have to pay to get into our school. And so they say, oh, we don't care. And so 5,000 students this year are going to come to our school and we're, we're preventing them from coming. And all we're doing is treating them as an individual. So that's our ad adaptation. That's how we're adapting. And um, that's it.